Hello. Welcome to another edition of the Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival. In 1900, L. Frank Baum wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. It is said that it's a book that has never been out of print. Next to the Holy Bible and a few others, it's been translated to more languages than one can count. And today, we have a real treat for you. We have the great grandson of L. Frank Baum, Roger Stanton Baum. So if you'll join us, Click your heels together three times and think there's no place like home. We'll learn some of the fascinating stories behind his great grandfather, L. Frank Baum. Toto can come too. Please enjoy. So, all right, Roger, the first thing we need to do is we need to turn over the witch's hourglass because <laughs> we're Love it. time, and when this sand runs out, we are done with the interview. We run out. <laughs> we'll set that down. Okay. So, listen, first of all, I want to uh, thank go, go ahead. I just didn't, I don't want to get out of order here, but uh, the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival and what everybody does there and the dedication all those people put into it and reminding us of our wonderful history that we have, both freedom and the things that we cherish. And we need more of that today than ever. And thank goodness for the Cherry Blossom Festival and people like 
all all of you guys, and particularly you, uh, Richard, who dedicate so much time to people and and shows your love to others. I, I know I couldn't help. I don't want to rattle on here, but it shows your love to everyone you meet. And uh, uh, I'm impressed with all, all impressed with all the movie stars you got. There. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just lucky to be at the right place at the right time, I guess. That's kinda how it is. <laughs> Taking hands with presidents, you're you're doing things and everybody loves you, Red. Thank yeah, you for well, having thank you for having me on. It's great to be a part of this festival and, and, and like I said, they are an amazing group of people there in Marshfield, Missouri and all around the nation that that uh, come to that little town every April. So I'm very lucky. Our founder, um, Nicholas Inman, and his wife, Sarah, they host an amazing festival every year. And, uh, and people just have a great time. So we look forward to next year and be live and in person. But, you know, this is amazing to be able to do it this way um, and still bring a little bit of the festival live to our viewers uh, via, via the uh, Tell me, how are you and, and Charlene doing there up in Northern California? Well, we're, we're, well, the nice thing about it is we're closer to our daughter and uh, and family up here. You know, we I'm in love kind of where I was, uh, and um, uh, not because of any other reason, but it's basically we were there so long it was almost my home is uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I spent so much time there at the MGM signing books, uh, about seven years under contract with them. It was a personal appearance contract, and. I must have spent 24, I mean, we, when we, we added it all, I was there 24 days a month. Uh, I guess I gave a good part of my life there to that. But then I got a chance to meet all, all the Oz fans and all those people that are, are so important to all of us. And, uh, uh, the, and I can, I can well, the MGM, when it was, you know, the Wizard of Oz opened and they had that great wonderful courtyard with the characters in the middle and of course all the Oz decorations and the, the gift shop and everything so I can remember it really well uh, when they did that uh, Wizard of Oz theme and I was glad to see all of that go. I think did we meet there? I we, refresh my been a while. But, but I was a lot younger. I was a kid and I, I came and I got a I got a book signed and, and okay, yeah. okay. So, yeah. Yep. It, but it's great. Um, so I want to let's talk about the man that we're here for, and and really, it, um, he's the one who started all of this. And I I gave an intro earlier said that um, the Wizard of Oz, next to the Holy Bible, and probably only one or two other books, the only book that's never been out of and and has been translated to more more languages than one could count. So. Um, L. Frank Baum is, 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 you're lucky enough to have him as your great grandfather. And, uh, and he came up with The Wonderful Wizard of And it was published uh, uh, with, with a partner, W.W. Denslow, who was the illustrator for the book. But uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about L. Frank Baum and, and how he came up with those amazing stories of the imaginary land of Oz. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for the question. And, uh, it's one of those things that you stop to think about. A lot of our ideas come from, believe it or not, is, a, is the children themselves, the young people. And uh, one of one of great granddad's favorite times is when he was having people over to the house, particularly the young people, the neighborhood kids and whatnot. And great grandmother would serve them hot chocolate and they'd have cookies and they'd sit around his den, really, his office den. And he would uh, tell stories. Well, many times these ideas would come from the kids themselves. And he would interpret them from the questions they would ask. And the, one of the questions, they, for instance, he, uh, one child asked one time was, uh, what's the name of this new land, Mr. Baum? You know, they were always formal, Mr. Baum, back in those days. And uh, he, he looked around, and he looked around and said, my God, the new name. And because he'd already told parts of the story here and there and, and had put it all together. He, and he looked at the file cabinet. It was in the office there. And there was, of course, a typical file cabinet, A through, you know, C or something. The bottom drawer. He looked down at the bottom drawer and there was O through Z. O dash Z. Well, he said, well, Oz. 
<laughs> and that is true. That's where the word Oz came from, was from a filing cabinet in his office by the question of, a, of one of his children he was telling stories to in, at that time. And uh, he said, well, the new name of this land is Oz. And so that's, that took on and took its own life on, and it became a, it's become a, the name, of course, ever since. You know, a lot of these things come from children. Uh, I, I personally, in my books, we have about 20 on the market now, want to come from from uh, the ideas of kids. I go to, you know, you go to classrooms like Rich, you've done, and a lot of these come from the kids themselves, and that's exactly where, to answer your question, where great granddad got a lot of his ideas was right from the kid, and Maude, his wife, would jump in with a few. So, uh, lo and behold, uh, all of a sudden we have a new land. It's named, the word is Oz from the filing cabinet, and uh, we were off and running. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned Maud, and let's talk a little bit about her because unfortunately you didn't you didn't know your great granddad, but you did know your great grandmother, um, Maud Bob. And um, so tell me, what was she like uh, as a great grandma? As to my great grandma, what was she like? Well, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll, first off, I just want to add that, you know, I didn't know my great grandfather. Of course, it's hard to believe Oz is 120 years old now. 120 years old, the book. And uh, uh, she uh, herself was a grand lady of the old school you might say, and she sat in her big wing chair, and I would sit on the floor in front of her, and I might be the only one in the room. So, uh, yeah, I was always intimidated by great-grandmother. because She had that stern look and uh, had a heart of gold, but had that stern look and uh, scared me half to death <laughs> in her own way. And I would ask her questions, and she would re re return the uh, the answer. and, and uh, she she was a person that was loved by so many and was I me mean, you might say grand great grandfather's right hand lady right hand person she well, gave him ideas she would criticize him boy she would tell him oh no that doesn't sound good no i don't like that and then she'd tell him the opposite when things were good and uh it gave him encouragement and in, in a in a uh, a border you might say a border to his thinking, and and uh, thank goodness for great grandmother. In a way, her own way, her own family uh, was a great part of Susan B. Anthony's crew. Uh, her mother, am I right, babe? Yes. Her mother was uh, uh, part of the ones. There was three of them: Susan B. Anthony and the other two, Maude Gage Baum. Uh, Matilda. Matilda Gage, they're the ones that wrote the Triste on, on the women's rights. It was quite a volume, quite a tome. And uh, sh they, not too many people know that. So great grandma was, you know, inherited that type of thinking. She was a great person, a believer in, in women's uh, uh, rights, uh, activist, and that translated over to great granddad who boy he listened to her carefully and he was fortunate enough to marry her her mother what didn't think uh, great granddad was a very good catch she thought he was a real bum because his background was in musicals and, and he was an artist of sorts uh, he had he had quite he was an actor he was an actor and there his her mother thought, you don't want to marry an old bum actor who doesn't make any money and all that. And she says, well, I am. She says, well, you know, you can leave our home if you marry him. And she says, well, I guess I'll be moving. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah, was uh, not too good of a success, success businessman in the beginning. And uh, after he found his vision in, in uh, that he actually success but um they uh, bought uh, the property there in hollywood um which is now unfortunately gone but it's an amazing historical um house that was called ozcon 
and um, tell us a little bit about going to Oscott and what that was like. Well, Oscott, you know, you know, remember I was very, very young. I have this flashback. Of course, they have those geese around the ceiling, and they would, uh, that was part of the decoration the great granddad put in. I've forgotten the story why that was true, but he made the whole ceiling around the edges, around the corners of all geese, pictures of geese. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think maybe it came out from Mother Goose in prose. It was a book that uh, a lot of people are not that familiar with, but called Mother Goose in prose. And uh, at that particular time, he was involved with that. And I think that's probably lent itself to Oscott in the sense of the part of the decor there. He was a, uh, uh, the place that I remember was just basically the one room was smart, you know, it was Spartan in its furnishings. Uh, it did well and uh, for them. And it was a place that he could uh, kind of hide and hibernate and write. And, and uh, great grandmother loved, loved Oscott in her own way. And they were a very happy couple in that particular house. And Oscott was a, a special place for everyone. They gather and all the kids again, the neighborhood kids that come over there. And the neighborhood kids that would converse onto Oscott and, and listen to the stories that you're going to tell. And there are stories about some woozies. And, and, so um, I know someone who actually owns a woozy, and I think he may have got it from you guys, uh, Walter. And um, and so tell us about the woozy. Did he make them? Did and and was that just another character that he came up with? I gave that to him uh, for his collection because uh, he was such a he's such a big Oz fan, uh, and so I was given that by uh, a friend, and uh, was authenticated. Great grandma, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the woozy. First of all, the woozy is really a character that has not much of a history in Oz, except he was a guy that was uh, an animal that had a kind of a bad temper. <laughs> the munchkins would corral him, put him in a yard with fences, and he uh, sometimes got out of hand. But, but the woozy was a, it was just had a place in Oz that, Really, a minor place, but everybody thinks of it. I think it's a name, Woozy. I like to know what it came from myself. But uh, 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 I, I got this piece. Great granddad made an Uzi in his garage and carved it and formed it. The neck was a spring, and the tail was kind of a wooden uh, thing that came out from a, was tacked on with a with a nail and it was really kind of slacked up and made kind of fun. His body was a box. His uh, head was really in the form of a box, uh, but a terrible temperament and didn't get along much with anybody. But the munchkins nonetheless put him in a fence jar, let him roam, let him hop around. But that's about the story of the woozy. Nothing much to him except this wonderful imaginary little imaginative line and name that great granddad was so famous for. He, uh, yeah, well, I, I got to see uh, Walter. Walter just posted a video last week. Of course, you know his collection's amazing, and and um, and one could only you know wish for the you know, is in his, is his collection. Um, but he did post the video of the woos prominently in his cabinet, and um, sorry about how you all get. That was uh, that was really really special. So, um, talk. About I've, always, I've always wondered why the woozy had, had gained so much of a reputation of following when he has so little background to you know really actual background in Oz, except the, maybe it's because he was anticipatory of many of the characters who were loving and so forth. Here was this woozy going, kind of a crazy animal that would. Uh, well, uh, kind of had a bad temper and everything else, so maybe it was just the opposite. Maybe that well, attracted. I think you know, speaking of bad tempers, I think uh, that happens a lot with characters in books and movies. Um, and you know, there's another character in the movie that, um, or some characters in the movie that 
are very popular with Oz collectors and Oz fans, and that's the flying monkey. So, you know, the flying monkeys are, are very popular uh, amongst Wizard of Oz fans and kind of, you know, gain their own fan out there. There's a whole series of flying monkey websites and, and costume players who dress up as flying monkeys and everything. I had a chance to buy an actual flying monkey, which of course were rubber. Oh, Jones. 1939 movie, and uh, and I bid what? a certain amount, but then it got a little too rich for my blood, so I didn't I didn't get one. <laughs> oh, no. Well, they are priceless. I tell you, if you get your hands on anything original Oz uh, from the movie, it's it is priceless. It's such a wonderful following worldwide. You know, yeah. Oz. I'm lucky enough to have some um, some straw that uh, Ray sent me. Um, and I wrote to him, and as well as a few pieces of plywood that was supposedly used on the Yellow Brick Road um, there at the MGM Studios. But I knew Harry Monty, who played one of the winged monkeys, and um, he was a, a a little person there in Hollywood, and he got to play one of the winged monkeys. And uh, he told me some great stories about uh, about what it was like to be strung up in the actors of the MGM sound stages. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your lineage um, from your, your grandparents um, to, to your, fa your grandfather and then your father. Tell us uh, a little bit about that and what your, what your grandfather, Frank Baum, told you about, um, about his dad. Well, great granddad was, uh, as I mentioned before, we came on the air officially, I guess, uh, uh, was a, uh, 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 not great man, but my grandfather was a retired general in the U.S. Army. Uh, he received that on retirement. Uh, that was the rank they gave him as a retired person. He uh, he had very strict, very uh, very loving person. I'll never forget the time he came out when I was just just a child. Most of his time was the fact that he came out with his full uniform and all his medals and. Boy, was I impressed as a child. He did that for me, I think. And he came into the room, I, unexpectedly to me, and I, I still have these flashbacks. And here he was, he had medals from eye to shoe, it seems like. He was a, a fellow that, uh, that was part of a family that uh, believed in the goodness of people. Uh, I think that rubbed off on everybody Great granddad was certainly that way. He believed in the things that we don't always see so much today of, and we need more of it, and particularly in our schools, where we need, if you don't mind me, on a band center a little bit, but uh, we need more government in schools, talking to government Oz, and speaks to the goodness of people. I love courage and wisdom, all those things that uh, the characters themselves represent. For instance, the uh, scarecrow with his wisdom, the, the tin woman with his heart, uh, Dorothy with her love, uh, Lion with his courage. All those characters are, are, are part of our country, really, and its background. And yet, in the schools today, we're not teaching uh, government today. Uh, I go to schools and talk to the kids many times, and we don't see that. Uh, I, I won't stand this bandstand much longer, but we need more, more of this history. We need more of the uh, geography. When the kids are asked where their country is on the map, they can't find it or they can't find their state. And so those things are important. And I think Oz, I'm, I'm off the track. But Oz was one of those things you could always come back to and find, and find if you looked hard enough, or not so hard, you could find those things right in the Oz book. And uh, you just took a step back and said, my guy, uh, this, is, this is perfect for my child to read. There's no violence to speak up and speak into the wing monkeys. The wing monkeys are the kind of thing that most of the parents today say, oh, my God, the wing monkeys are scary. And has said, compared to what? <laughs> you know, you know there really weren't. And so there wasn't any violence in us. And, uh, and uh, so great granddad was that type of person. Great. My dad uh, was a person who uh, followed that description. 
He always taught me to be good and try to be, do my best. And of course, in my day, which goes back a while, you know, 91 years old here, goes back a while to the point where I still remember the, the lessons and some of the teachings, and then I compare them to the Oz books. And by the way, uh, Rich, as you know so well, he wrote, you know, he wrote um, 62 books. Many of those were under pen names. A lot of people don't realize they have Oz in their libraries because it's under a pen name or some kind of some other title like the James Mises and so forth. All wonderful books. But fortunately for Oz, it kept his real name, his actual name. And, and that's not, you know, when the movie was made, a lot of people are familiar with Oz because of the movie. Yeah, let's and, talk a little bit about that because um, Maude, you're, you're grandmother was alive when the movie was made and, and in fact she got to go to the premiere uh which was held at, at Grand Theater in 1939 there in Hollywood. So what was what was her take on the movie and your family and what did that movie mean to you as a kid growing up knowing that um because of your great grandfather um one of the most um American classic movies uh in history will be forever. So what did Maud think uh, of The Wizard of Oz in 1939 when it was released? Well, thanks for saying that, first of all. I certainly hope it will be there forever. And uh, it's, uh, what was it like is your question? Basically, you're, you're saying. Yeah, you knew every year uh, when that came on on television that it, you know, it was because of your great grandfather that that was being aired on television. And really, that's when Wizard of, The Wizard of Oz, the movie now, we're, we've kind of transitioned out of the book for a second and gone to the movie. But that Wizard of Oz really being super popular and worldwide uh, was in its first airing uh, on television. So what was that like growing up knowing that your grandfather was responsible for all of that, your great grandfather? Well, you know, naturally, I think we were a little bit humbled. And very, uh, didn't we weren't too braggadocio. We were very proud, proud to be a part of the family. It certainly hasn't hurt my writing, my promotion. To be all honest, there's uh, you know, it's true, and, and it's in, one of the reasons too. Now it's gotten so predominant, so now in 72 different languages worldwide, and I understand. It's now, it actually has outsold the Potter book. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Because we see Potter everywhere. Well, the rate, well, it just doesn't need that much publicity. It runs on its own momentum. And um, on a worldwide basis, it has outsold Potter. Of course, it has had a, I'm bragging a little bit, but on the other hand, it's had a head start. Uh, it's been around for 120 years. And uh, so it really had a head start out of most books. It's really America's first true American fairy tale. And uh, even, even the uh, robot, uh, TikTok, named after one of our dogs, but our dog is named after, after the robot. TikTok was a, the first really robot in, uh, in literature. It was a character that ran on electric, well, most, mostly a mechanical system. You had to wind up his head for his brain to work. <laughs> and you wound up his body for his uh, body to work. So you, somebody would always have to keep him wound up both keys, one for his head, one for his brain, in other words, one for his body. And if one ran down before the other, he was stuck by uh, just having his brain working, not his body, or vice versa. Could be quite a problem. But there, there you go with another first for Oz uh, robot. Probably we can't think of any other one that is, is uh, first. Oz, uh, going back to the book um, uh, written in 1900, is that this book was a very expensive book to publish. Uh, because of the illustrations uh, by W. W. Denslow, um, and and it was a, a, a quite an expensive book, I understand, to publish for its time. So um, tell us about that a little bit. Um, and I know their relationship um, was a was a solid relationship in the beginning, and it kind of went um, went a little bit bad uh, towards the end. But 
Um, tell us about how those two got together as far as the publishing of the book. That was quite a, uh, a battle with the publishers. The publisher, Lee, uh, what they they finally came to an arrangement, a compromise. They didn't want to publish the book in color because it was so expensive. Color and printing and the color uh, uh, in those days for a book was almost prohibitive. And great granddad was insistent and he made a promise he said look i'll tell you what you hold back the rest of my royalties on my other books and let's get this one published in color so he he forgot he forgot his just his or for went his uh his uh royalties and all the other books that he had written up to that time like i said he wrote gosh he's 63 books in his lifetime. Most of them were uh, novels, so quite a work. And uh, so when he gave up that, the publisher finally relented and said, okay, we'll do this in color. But he's not, he wasn't going to see any royalties for a while from his other books until they saw the success of this one. It really broke the ice for many, many books, many, uh, many other uh, authors to have their books done in color because of great granddad's, uh, you know, insistence. And thank goodness he had the background of the books on the market to go ahead and back up what he was promising. And so the publisher said, okay, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and do this in color. Was a little bit reluctant to, um, to sell the rights um, uh, to the book? You know, the right, that's a mystery to my side of the family. Uh, always wondered how that all worked out. Not sure. Louis B. Mayer actually bought the book. Uh, he bought the book for, with the intention of having Shirley Temple play the part of Dorothy. Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Also, there's a question I had to ask you as far as, uh, and see if you ever had heard this, there are so many myths um, in regarding The Wizard of Oz, both the book as well as the movie. We'll talk about a couple here in a second, but um, one of them is the name Dorothy. And, and there are a couple stories that the name Dorothy uh, may have come from a prominent banker's daughter in Chicago that was either friends with your great grandfather or W.W. Denslow. Um, and do you know any of that story or do you, have you heard um, about well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I've heard that side of it. Uh, what I understand it came from, and of course, all this is, is subject to possibilities, but was from a child in the neighborhood who was very dear. She wasn't that well of a child, health-wise. Uh, she uh, loved great-granddad and great-grandma would show up with the rest of the kids for story time and her name was Dorothy. And uh, so we went ahead and uh, uh, ended up naming uh, Dorothy Dorothy because of her. Okay. And, and just, just the illness, she was not well. And I think they, uh, they thought this would be a wonderful thing for her, for her and her friend. What do you think that Maud, um, or what do you hear that Maud, how she thought of the movie, what she thought of it? She loved it. She used to go on the set with uh, with Judy Garland, and they would talk, and they would sit around and talk and chit chat. She got to know Judy pretty well. Exactly. And, Eighteen years old, and again, we went back and we said that you know Louis B. Mayer had initially bought the rights and and was going to make the movie for Shirley Temple, but it was understood that uh, Shirley did not have the pipes to um, to get well, out. That's good. Well, I tell you, John, Richard, I uh, I got to tell you. Yeah, that's exactly on 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 uh, Mark. The she just not she didn't have the the voice. You're right, and uh, Judy did, and uh, they wanted somebody who could really build up those famous songs over the rainbow and so forth. And uh, Judy uh, fit the bill. It's a, kind of one of those things that you could say in five words. Uh, Judy had the talent, the singing talent. And it's not to say that uh, Shirley Temple wouldn't have been able to make a wonderful Dorothy, but it, 
it wouldn't have been the same. No, and you, you talked about Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and um, a few years back, uh, I got to take Jerry uh, Marin, who was a, a dear friend of mine, and I knew you knew Jerry very well. Oh, Jerry yeah. was surviving uh, of the little people of the original Munchkins, played the, lo the um, leader of the Lollipop Guild, gave Judy the lollipop. Well, several years ago, I took Jerry to, um, to now Sony Pictures, which is, was the old MGM lots, and he hadn't been back to the studio in years and years and years, but he and I got a private tour of the sound stages and, um, and all the areas, including the Munchkinland sound stage, and we, uh, we got to stand on the spot that Judy recorded over the rainbow in the recording studio, and that was just amazing. But can you imagine that the, um, the makers of the film actually cut over the rainbow in the beginning in the first cut because they thought that it was uh, too long and um, they thought it wasn't distinguished enough for an MGM star to sing in a barnyard. But uh, luckily it prevailed and, and Somewhere Over the Rainbow made it into the film and, and really became Judy Garland's signature song. Richard, that's so true. And another thing that was a hiccup there for a while was uh, when they were writing the uh, music, uh, uh, it was Irving Berlin, I believe. They couldn't, when they wrote the song, it just didn't sound right. It didn't come out the way you hear it today. It was something that they fought over and really had a hard time making it uh the way it is and make it so popular make it so sentimental and such a wonderful melody and one one of, one of the things that finally Irving berlin told them and i'm trying to think of the name i'm so embarrassed right now i can't think of the two uh songwriters uh harold arlen and um oh, yeah thanks rich thank you boy that's terrible but thank you for your help uh yes and they they didn't like it and uh, Irving Berlin, merely with his genius, said, just slow it down. They had it at a much more of a higher tempo. And they said, just slow, the, slow it all down. So they, whatever it is in music they do, but they cut it down to a reasonable, reasonable tempo. And all of a sudden you hear what you hear today. So it was yeah, really, it really, it really, at Irving Berlin, which is, of course, one of the, the most famous songwriters in American film, um, history, uh, was responsible for letting those two guys know, hey, this is what you want to do to uh, to get the song right, is slow it down a little bit. And so, uh, thanks to his help. Richard, you ought to be on the other end of this uh, phone call, because <laughs> I think you know most of this anyway, but uh, that's true. I'm a boss aficionado. I have to say, my my wife always uh, always gets on me because anytime it's on TV, and it was on TNT last week, uh, a series of days over the over the course of the week. Anytime it's on, I turn it in and and at least watch just a little bit of it. I've probably watched it at least a couple times a year, at least, and have done so ever since I was a kid. And the reason I became such an Oz fan was because it it really meant to me my childhood. And, and I remember what it was like, just like every other American uh, kid growing up, to sit in front of the television set once a year and watch that magic happen. And it was magic. And it was interesting that we talked about the book and how expensive it was to do in color because it was expensive uh, for the same sense to do a film in 1938 in color. And it was actually one of the first films that was done in Tacticolor simultaneously with the... with. Well, all made at the same time um they use every single light in hollywood to light that's those sound stages at the mgm because of the technicolor and that brand new technicolor film so to imagine what it was like when uh when she opened the door from kansas to the imaginary land of oz and
Munchkin Land. That was just incredible. So that's kind of where I go when I was uh, for my love of Oz. But let's talk a little bit about the movie and some of the myths behind the movie because there are so many legends that are um, are associated with the Wizard of Oz, and one of them is associated with your great grandfather, and that is that of the the actor um, Frank Morgan actually played a series of characters uh, in the movie. He played the uh, coach, the carriage driver. He played the doorman. He played, uh, of course, the wizard uh, from the Wizard of Oz. But he also played in the beginning of the movie Professor. <laughs> Morgan's coat that he's wearing in the beginning of the film says that it was actually, it actually belonged to your great grandfather, L. Frank Baum, and that when they opened the inside of it in the pocket, it actually said L. Frank Baum. And the story goes that Maud had donated a bunch of your great grandfather's clothes to the Salvation Army. And of course, back then, the MGM costumers used to go around to Salvation Armies and places like that to get some of the costumes. So is there any story, I want you to see if you can put this is there any truth to the story that actor L. Frank, or Frank Morgan was wearing your great-grandfather's coat in the beginning of the film? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as, like I said earlier, Rich, you can take the other side of this interview. The, uh, 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 well, by the way, I'd well, like to regress just a moment on the previous question, the, how much you enjoyed it and watched it. And, and uh, just add a little uh, whipped cream to that. The, the uh, Turner... Ted Turner, who owns the rights, the movie rights still, to this, uh, every time he wants to increase his ratings for a particular night, he doesn't do as much as he used to, but, but every time he wanted to re increase his ratings, he put on The Wizard of Oz, and <laughs> that would increase the ratings of Turner, Turner Network tremendously because everybody would watch that no matter what else was on. So if there was something really competing that he didn't want and he wanted his program to shine, he'd put on The Wizard of Oz. Anyway, that's another situation just sort of terrible. Uh, do you remember when you first saw the movie? Oh, my golly, I don't. Uh, 91 years old here, Rex. You know, I, can, uh, I, can, barely, I can barely hold the receiver here. Uh, anyway. Uh, You've set it up. You've got to set it up somewhere against something and then you don't have to hold it. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, listen, on the Wizard's Coat thing, uh, uh, this really goes to a situation where, as I refresh my memory, the uh, coat itself was uh, given, it was picked out by Frank Morgan, and it came, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering my thoughts, obviously, he didn't like the original coat that the wardrobe department had issued him. And uh, he just didn't like it. I didn't think it had the wizard touch or feeling or taste for him. So he went to they went to different studios, wardrobe departments, and they couldn't find the coat that would fit uh, Frank Morgan's uh, needs. Uh, Finally, they said, well, Frank, why don't you go out and, uh, and see what, see, look at some of the used clothing stores around Hollywood and see if you can find one. Maybe you can, you, you can find one. So he and uh, one of the other people, I don't know who it was, went with him. And uh, he went to different clothing stores. And, and finally, after hunting and everything else, he found a coat that he liked. Well, he brought it back, uh, put it on. They had it tailored for him. It all looked good. He was happy. And uh, put it on, and that's the one he played with in the movie. However, there was a label on the inside of that coat. And it was faded. It had been washed. The coat had been washed several times, obviously, over the years. And, and the, that label had become dull. It was hard to read. And I, but you still can make it out carefully if you looked, I guess. And so this time they really looked. And they studied the label and brought it, put it under light and all that kind of thing. And sure enough, on that label, 
was the name L. Frank Baum, written in great granddad's handwriting. And wouldn't you know it, the book, the the coat itself, the one he wore in the movie, was actually great granddad's coat. And it was one that he wore and had given away, like you say, Salvation Army. And it became uh, it became part of the movie. It became one of the one of the clothing that was worn. Just amazing story, one in a million, and that's true of a lot of things about Oz. You know, it has so much mystery and wonderful things about it, and we keep discovering new and new and more and better things as we go through the years. Talking about clothing and 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 what it meant to the the movie, um, the most famous movie memorabilia. Uh, in piece in history has to be these beautiful um, ruby slippers, uh, and these are replica pair, exact replicas that I have. Oh, those are original. What are you talking about, Richard? Those are the real McCoy. Oh, I wish they were the real McCoy. They're, tell me about it. I wish they were, but they're pretty good replicas that uh, that a friend of mine made for me with the um, with the orange felt on the bottom, and and they yeah. even have. Garland's name inside, and they're two different sizes because a lot of folks didn't realize, but Judy had two different size feet. Uh, size feet, so uh, they are two different oh. sizes, but they're different than than Heather's original idea because in the books they were silver slippers, and uh, and from what I understand, silver d didn't really film well, and because they were shooting in Technicolor, they decided to change the color from silver. To uh, to ruby red, um, and of course, there's no rubies on the slippers. It was they were made of sequins and all hand done. But uh, it was interesting that they they chose to change the color, and then of course, the ruby slippers have become the most iconic piece uh, of, of film memorabilia and most recognizable uh, in the history of cinema. Yeah, that's true. As a matter of fact, the uh, Smithsonian Institute has a pair. You probably know this, Rick, and uh, it's. They they say it's their most popular exhibit. The yes. kids come and they find out about it and they want to see it. Uh, they just redid the whole exhibit uh, a couple of years ago, and and the ruby slippers feature prominently now in their own area of the, the Smithsonian. And of course, I was stationed in Washington for so many years. So uh, every time we would be downtown, or I would take folks, family, friends to the Smithsonian. Yeah. I don't. Yeah for those ruby slippers but what a lot of people don't know about those slippers is actually those were um those were some of the rehearsal slippers that were used those particular slippers in the um uh in the smithsonian um that judy actually used during a lot of the rehearsal sequences and that's where the the orange felt came from um on the bottom of them but hey uh roger i think we lost your oh, there you go here we are good one of, one of the things, getting back to what we were talking about on the color and the slippers and the Smithsonian and whatnot, the, uh, and you hit it right on the head, the only uh, thing to make it a little more understandable, when you actually picture silver on yellow, the yellow brick road, like you alluded to, but in a little more detail explaining it, that when you see the silver on the yellow, it kind of washes out. Silver and yellow just don't contrast well. So again, like you said, Rich, so elegantly, is that the uh, is that the shoes ruby really worked against yellow, and that's the history behind that color a little bit. Mystery in Hollywood and 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 scandal in Hollywood. This Charlie, thing. The stories of the ruby. There are countless stories of the ruby slippers in Hollywood. There were um, six pair, there were six pair, there were five pair. Um, but and how they were found uh, for, the, for the auction. I'm uh, so sorry. Okay. Are you still, you're still with us. I can see you, you can see me. So, um, But the ruby slippers were actually discovered in, in, in a storage um, rack uh, at the end of the video. I can't hear them. Well, get your hand away from them. Okay. They discovered that they had somebody out to. Um, We're having trouble hearing you now, uh, Rich. Right? Okay. Why would you do that? Can you hear me now? Can 
there. How's that oh. now? Press the like, what happened? The volume went down and something. I don't know. Well, I was just talking about the ruby slippers and, and the kind of the lore and the mystery behind the ruby slippers. Um, you know, that there were seven pair originally, maybe there were eight pair, there were six pair. Um, they, they were lost forever in, in, in the studios. And it was only until uh, 1970 when a, um, a person came in that MGM had hired to go through their costume departments and, and they were having an auction because MGM had had a lot of financial troubles back then they uh, decided to sell most of their um, stock of movie memorabilia, costumes, set pieces. Tell the folks how we can get uh, any of your books or, um, or possibly uh, see some of your work or get anything that you'd like to talk about or anything, and then we'll close. Sure. And, and uh, well, just, just really to make it simple for everyone and to remember, it's just, just Google my name, Roger S. Baum, S is in Sam Baum, and uh, you'll find my website there. Oh, it'll, awesome. and it'll show. Uh, there's another one which uh, is uh, OzAuthor.com, and uh, but just my name will do it. It pops up. Uh, there's articles from People Magazine there, and uh, uh, a bunch, some several other articles. I hope people will find interesting. And at the same time. Uh, we have about 19 books on the market now. We're 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 working on another one. Uh, Pelican Press, as I hope, are looking at that carefully. Uh, Disney's looking at another book for me, so maybe we'll see some more Oz out there for people to enjoy. Uh, I'm doing my best to try. I probably have over a hundred different copies of uh, from different languages and all that. But what a great gift it would be for anybody to have or give uh, during the holidays or for special occasions um, is a copy of of The Wizard of Oz or any of your books. I mean, imagine getting a book from the great grandson of the creator of The Wizard of Oz. Well, uh, thank you, and I'm honored. To, I'm honored to uh, see I'm you. It's been been a long time. You have a wonderful family. Your military history. Richard is outstanding. Thank you. Uh, when you when you're dressed up in that uniform with all your medals, it uh, I can barely see you <laughs> because <laughs> well, of the medals. I told people they asked me about all my medals, and I always told people I just went to the store at the clothing sales and bought whichever. <laughs> Um, I'm looking at the witch's hourglass, and it's almost out of its magical sand. So that means our time is up. But we encourage you to come back, Roger, and and join us for um, the 2021 uh, Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival uh, held in Marshfield, Missouri. It will be the 15th annual live event. So we encourage you to come back and uh, and join us then. But Roger, Charlene, thank you so much. You guys stay safe out there in Northern California. And everyone, thank you for tuning in to the wonderful Wizard of Oz and the history of the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Well, well I, I just want to say quickly, I, I'm honored to see you and meet you and all the, your uh, thousands of fans. So this is really a, a, an honor for me and I appreciate it. Thanks again, Roger. Take care, you guys, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Step into the sun, step into the light. Step into the sun, step into the light. Keep straight ahead for the most glorious place on the face of the earth, for the sky. Hold on to your breath, hold on to your heart, hold on to your home. You're out of the woods, you're out of the dark, you're out of the night.